Just woke up and Advent's over. <laughs> December's just been kind of a blur, let's just put it that way. And I'd like to begin, first of all, by thanking Pastor Bob. He has done an amazing job of filling in in so many ways while I've been out of commission. So let's thank him for his service, okay? And I want you to know that I didn't take my pain medicine or my muscle relaxer today because if I would have, I'd probably have to have a disclaimer on my sermon that uh, says what comes out of my mouth may not reflect the teachings of this church or my beliefs. So, uh, but I'll be taking it right after church today, I guarantee you. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son into this world to take us off the naughty list so we could become your forgiven children and heirs of eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm one who loves to sing Christmas songs. In fact, I could sing Christmas songs all year long. Whether they're the sacred songs or the silly songs, there's something about Christmas songs that can touch your heart in a way that other songs just cannot do. Now, there's a few exceptions I could do without, like Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer. I don't think I need to sing that one. But for the most part, I could sing Christmas songs all throughout the year. But I will tell you that from the time I was a little child, there was one song I couldn't stand to sing. It's a song I'll bet most of you know by heart, and it's one that you probably sing with gusto. And so I'm going to let you do that today, and then I'm going to tell you why I can't stand that song, okay? Let's put it up on the screen. Do you know that song? Let's sing it, okay? You better watch out. You better not cry. Better not pout, I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. He's making a list and checking it twice. Gonna find out who's naughty and nice. Santa Claus is coming to town. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. Oh, you better watch out. You better not cry. Better not pout. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. If you're a kid, I don't know how you can sing that song and not be afraid. Because look at what it says about Santa Claus. This song warns us that Santa Claus is all-seeing and all-knowing. And his goal is to prove you're naughty so that he can come from the North Pole and give you a lump of coal. And as if that's not bad enough, he sends his helpers to spy on you in your home. That's the job of this guy, Elf, on the shelf. He is Santa's spy who goes from room to room trying to catch you being naughty so that he can tell Santa on you. I don't know if you can read these signs, but I love these dogs. One has a sign that says, I ate Elf on the Shelf. And the other one says, I helped because he's creepy. <laughs> Way to go, dogs. Get rid of Santa's spies. Seriously, though, as a little child, this is how I pictured Santa. Not as some jolly, generous old man who wanted to fill my house with gifts because I was so nice, but as a grumpy, grouchy old man who wanted to fill my heart with guilt because I was so naughty. So each year as Christmas drew near and kids and adults, you know what this is like. Like every other child, you felt obligated to try to convince Santa that you were nice and that others were naughty or at least not as nice as you, right? And the hope is, if I'm nicer than others, Santa's going to reward me by giving me gifts because I deserve them. But I worried that if I was naughtier than others, Santa would have to punish me because that's what I deserved. But the problem is, no matter how hard I tried to be nice, I never knew how nice I had to be. I never knew if I was nice enough. And it's interesting, now that I'm older, I'm amazed at how often I see people treat God like he's some Santa Claus in the sky. Jesus is coming back to town, and he's going to punish or reward us based on whether we're naughty or nice. That's how many people view 
our God. And so we better be nice. And so we set these standards for what we believe is naughty and what's nice. And then we try to look nice in God's eyes by comparing ourselves to those who look naughty in our eyes. But there's a problem with this, and that is God doesn't follow our standards for naughty and nice. He actually has a standard of his own. And based on that standard, i got some bad news for you. We're all on the naughty list. Check this out. Let's read this verse from Psalm 51, verse 5. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. See, this verse reminds us that as heirs of Adam and Eve's fall into sin, we are all conceived in sin, and we begin our lives on the naughty list. Not only that, let's read the next verse. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So this verse is for people who say, well, it's not fair that because of Adam and Eve, we're on the naughty list. This verse reminds us we've all sinned uh, more than enough to qualify for the naughty list. Thank you very much. And now look at this last verse. Let's read it. All of us have become like one who's unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. So no matter how hard we try, we fall short of the nice list. God says even the nice things that we do are like filthy rags. So it doesn't matter how much we compare ourselves to others to make ourselves look good in God's eyes. We can't make that nice list on our own. And that was a very important point that Jesus had to drive home with some Jewish religious leaders in the gospel reading today. They brought a naughty woman to Jesus. These Jewish religious leaders had been doing everything that they could to try to find a way to trap Jesus so that they could accuse him and then find a way to condemn him to death. So they brought before Jesus a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. And then they said, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? Now like you... I know enough about biology to know that it takes two to tango. So I wonder why the Jewish religious leaders didn't also bring a man before Jesus. After all, the law of Moses really said that both the man and the woman would be stoned if they were caught committing adultery. Seems like they conveniently found a way for the man to escape. And I can't help but wonder if that man was one of them because they were doing everything they could to try to trap Jesus so he could be killed. Well, whatever the case, it was clear in their minds this woman was on the naughty list. And since she was on the naughty list, if Jesus didn't say she should be punished, then that would put him on God's naughty list too. But as the Jewish religious leaders stood proudly with their chests puffed out in self-righteousness, Jesus did something interesting. He bent down, which I'd like to try to demonstrate what he did, but I don't think I better. He bent down to the ground, though, and he started to write on the ground. And as he did, these Jewish religious leaders kept harping on him, demanding that Jesus tell them what he's going to do with this naughty woman. Well, Jesus stands up and he says to them, Let any of you who's without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Jesus draws a line in the sand, doesn't he? on what it takes to be on the nice list. He says, if you're without sin, go ahead. You can throw a stone at her. And then he bends down again, and he keeps writing. I can't help but think that what Jesus was writing on the ground was all the naughty things these religious leaders had done. Because what happens is they all just drop a stone, and they walk away. Because they realize Jesus had convicted them that they too We're on God's naughty list. Let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw the stone at her. So in that group, there was only one who was without sin, and that was Jesus. There was only one who could have stoned this woman, and that was Jesus. But he didn't do it. Instead, he forgave her. And he gave her a place on the nice list. Not because of anything she had done, but because of the forgiveness that he offered her. And that forgiveness that he offered her is the forgiveness that he would win then on the cross, not only for her, but for you and for me. 
I love this verse in Colossians chapter 2. It says, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, in other words, the charge against us because of our sin, which stood against us and condemned us, in other words, put us on the naughty list, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Because of our sin, this verse is telling us we owe a debt to God that we could never pay. That debt stands against us, it condemns us, it keeps us on the naughty list. And it keeps us from ever having a right relationship with God. But the good news is that Jesus took that debt away. He nailed our naughty lists on the cross, and he died to pay the debt for our sins. For those of you who uh, have worshipped here on Good Friday, uh, you know the special way that this wonderful truth is demonstrated in those services. During the services, we take time to write down sins that are plaguing us, and we write them on flash paper. And then we take that flash paper and we nail it to the wooden crosses. And then at the end of the service, after we speak the last words that Jesus spoke on the cross, it is finished, we light that flash paper, and then the sins all disappear. It's a beautiful picture of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And it's all because of an amazing gift exchange that he made. And it's such an unfair gift exchange for Jesus. But look at what he did, according to 2 Corinthians. For he made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So on the cross, Jesus traded place with us. He put himself on the naughty list on the cross so that we could be placed on the nice list. He took the punishment we deserved, and then he gave us the heaven that we don't deserve. And that's why Jesus came to town that first time. And that's why when Jesus comes to town again, either at our death or on the last day, we don't have to be worried or afraid that Jesus is coming to town. Because thanks to Jesus, our names are written in the book of life. And that's the only list that ultimately matters. That beautiful truth has touched our family in a very special way this year because as I speak, our Aunt Irene is in hospice care and very near death. She's been waiting to go home for a long time and soon Jesus is going to come for her to take her home. She'll have a chance to be home for Christmas. And she's going to get to celebrate for eternity how nice heaven is. And this is why we celebrate our Savior's birth. Because of Jesus' forgiveness, when God looks at us, he doesn't see the naughty things that we've done. He sees the forgiveness that Jesus has won for us. And because of that forgiveness, one day we're going to get to go to heaven too. I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty nice of God. Amen. It certainly is wonderful that in response to what God has done for us in Christ,